Thank you. So yeah, I'm here to tell you um, something about the science of thermal comfort. Um, and I promise you will learn very little new things today because a lot of these things you will already know. All I'm doing is making sure you are aware of them. So um, <clears throat> it's uh, November, it's almost Christmas, so it's, time of, it's that time of year for thermostat arguments. Who's, who's had any yet so far? Yeah? <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, I am quite conflict avoidant as a person, so I don't like arguments, um, and especially not one where, you know, people are just coming from different sides. And I wonder, like, is there, you know, my, my sort of deep need is to find, okay, maybe science can, prove, can help us with the answer. Maybe science can tell us what the ideal thermostat setting is or how to resolve this conflict. Um, and I'm going to apply it in theory, but also in practice with some analysis I don't, did on my own home as well. So um, for a long time, basically, there was no research into thermal comfort. You, you know, if it was cold, you would put on a jumper, um, you would light a fire, or you would die if you were not so lucky to have either of those. Um, and if you were hot, then you would, um, you know, you would blow some air at yourself, you would stop, you know, doing what you're doing, take a siesta, sit next to a fountain. Um, but basically, mainly the sort of solution was to not do very much. Um, and yeah, we had an intuitive understanding of thermal comfort, and we knew when we were comfortable, and we knew when we were not. Um, but there was no science behind it, really, until the late 19th century. When, um, you know, the previous solutions of not doing very much when it was hot um, didn't work because we wanted to send people into mines to mine, and that is intensive work, and it's hot and humid in mines, and so we ran into a limit of like, oh, we are trying to get people to do stuff, but they don't want to do it, or they can't do it, they're exhausted, they collapse, they faint, that leads to accidents and injuries. And so basically, as soon as this problem became a bigger problem, um, people started doing research. So this is a picture of J.S. Haldane, who was a British um, physiologist, who performed a lot of ex interesting experiments on himself, including um, decompression for, for, sort of, um, for diving and so on, and poisoned himself in a lot of different ways. But um, one of the good things he did um, was to, to go into mines and sort of study the conditions, really looking at sort of, you know, what is comfort, um, what is possible, you know, what conditions can people work. And he found that, you know, in a, in a hot and humid place, sort of, you can, um, if it's sort of 100% humidity, uh, you can be, you can not overheat up to 34 degrees. That's the sort of wet bulb temperature that you may have heard of, that if it's exceeded, then basically people will die. He, he discovered that, he was the first person to discover that. Um, so that's if it's 100% humidity and 34 degrees. But if it's 100% humidity and you're actively working, then that limit is actually 25 degrees, especially if the air is still. So, you know, this was sort of first inkling of, of figuring out um, you know, what thermal comfort really was and what the limits of, of, sort of human physiology were. Then the sort of next big uh, research came from when air conditioning was invented. So air conditioning was invented by a man named Willis Carrier in the US initially to, um, to basically make paper. So the problem was they were making paper in a very humid place and the pa paper would keep curling up and you know, that's not very good paper. So um, he discovered that if you create, um, if you compress a, a fluid or a, a gas, um, basically, and turn it into a fluid, um, that creates heat. But then if you evaporate it on the other end, then that creates a cool, that creates cold. And so you can use this to, to dry the air, but also to, to cool it. And so this basically led to the invention of air conditioning, um, the spread of people throughout this, the southern US, and also a lot of research into, okay, well, now that we can condition the air, we could always heat air, but this was the first time we could cool air and dehumidify it. And so this led to um, a lot of research on what the ideal conditions were for, for thermal comfort. Um, one interesting thing about this research is that um, this was done 
mainly on sort of soldiers and mine workers, sort of like very fit people in their early 20s and 30s. Um, and it was also only men that they did this expert sort of research on. And then you look at, look at a few more papers and you're like, all these subjects were unclothed. So basically you've got some researchers like looking at like, oh, let's put like a, a bunch of hot, sweaty men naked into a room and let's see how, how they get on. You kind of have to wonder if the researchers had any ulterior motives. Um, anyway, so doing this research, we, we kind of um, realized that there are quite a few different factors to thermal comfort. And this is coming back to that point of what I said, that you know I'm teaching you nothing new. These things all make sense. So thermal comfort is a function of um, air temperature, right here. It's a function of um, air speed. So if it's, uh, you know, if the wind blows, you tend to feel colder. Um, it's a function of humidity. So if it's really humid, like if you go to a hot, humid place, you find it really hard to sweat. You might sweat a lot more. That's because that evaporative action isn't as effective. It's harder to, to sweat, and so you don't cool as much. Um, so that humidity is a big factor, especially in, in heat. Then clothing insulation, obviously. Um, we've worked out this scientific standard for, for clothing level, um, which you know will come up again. Um, metabolic rate, so basically how active we are. If you're working up a sweat, that's um, you know you you can um, you can really increase the amount of heat you produce and therefore how hot you feel. So the average human produces um, sort of 100, 110 watts, uh, but that can go up to like, you know, if you look at sort of um, uh, Tour de France cyclists, I think they do like 700 watts, a kilowatt to 1,000 watts. So it can really go up quite a lot. Um, and then there's a, a factor that took people a long time to really discover or uh, make sense of, which is radiant temperature, which is, which is essentially how hot are the surfaces and point sources around me. So basically, you know, a long way for, for saying like, am I, if I'm in the sun, then my radiant temperature is high because I get a lot of radiation from the sun. Um, but, and so that one is a really obvious one. You know, if you're in the sun, then you're hot, and if you're not, then you're not. Um, but I think it's, this is one of the, the least well uh, understood ones, especially when it comes to cold surfaces. So for example, um, when we sit next to a cold, like a big glass window that's cold, um, we lose a lot of heat to that window. And so it, the window feels cold um, just because we, we, we radiate a lot to that um, uh, window. And it doesn't radiate much back. So um, that's also the, the sort of main mechanism for heat in space um, or for, for heat, heat loss and heat gain in space. But maybe that's a, a bit of a different topic. Um, so basically, we um, developed these funny looking charts um, I showed you one earlier. This was also invented by Willis Carrier, the man who invented air conditioning. Um, and it basically shows the, um, the temperature. This uh, here on the x-axis is a um, combination of air temperature and radiant temperature. So yeah, like, um, like I said, it's sort of a mix of, a mix of the two. And this is kind of humidity. So what this is saying is basically in winter when you have more clothes, then you should be comfortable from around 20 degrees, um, depending on your so the air and radiant. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, and then if you're in summer, you could be comfortable from sort of 23 up to 27 if you're wearing fewer clothes. Um, but if it's hotter, then um, you know you're you're. Uh, you know, if it's more humid, sorry, then um, you, you might uh, be less comfortable. So, you know, let's put, let's bring this back to the thermostat wars because that's where we, that's what I promised you, um, and it is important. So, this is my study at home. Um, it's a, uh, it's a pretty small study. I sit here. There's my desk. Um, here is a radiator, and this is the wall. That's somewhat cold, but because I only have one old wall. Um, it's not that bad, really. Um, so I measured, because I only have, it's a pretty small room, and um, the uh, there's not that much heat loss. My air temperature is actually 25 and a half degrees. So it's a bit warmer than what the rest of the house is. 
Um, because the radiator is right here, right next to me, um, I actually measured the, the radiant temperature at 24 degrees. So that's already a bit warmer. And so if you plug those numbers in into the calculator, there is an, an online calculator that you can use for your thermostat wars. Um, it basically tells you, okay, you know, the mean vote is minus 0 0.02, which is basically zero, so neutral. And the percentage of people that would be dissatisfied in these conditions is 5%, which is the lowest it can ever get, which is also a, a funny thing, saying that we no one can ever be happy, <laughs> according to sides. Um, but okay, yeah, you know, so I, I tell my wife, look, we're, you know, it's perfectly, perfectly comfortable. Um, except then when I look at her room, which she has the bigger study, so we, you know, quick aside, we live on the Isle of Wight, um, which is why we have a somewhat bigger house than most people in London. But um, anyway, so she has a, um, a study that's in the corner of the, of the uh, house, and she has two cold walls. Um, and then because uh, this used to be a kitchen, there's only one radiator, which is here. Um, and so when you can't really see this, but this is a thermal image of her room. Um, this is her screen, and this is her desk. And this is the wall, and it's 16 degrees. Uh, and the radiator, which is here, is not working so well. It needs to be flushed, and it's 39 degrees which is quite a bit colder than the one I had, which is 50. So you plug those numbers in. Okay, it's actually a bit colder because she has a small radiator and two cold walls. Air temperature 19, uh, but the mean, the, the radiant temperature is 17. So that's a lot lower. And so as a result, the, it's much, the, you know, the, the thermal model says like, this is comfortable in these conditions and this is where we are. So, you know, in this case, um, the, the sort of idea of like, okay, the thermostat will tell us that we're all comfortable is false because there are many other different factors that we didn't consider. Um, air temperature being one, but radiant temperature being a strong um, other one. So what am I gonna do? I'm not going to raise the thermostat in the house because that would kind of not work very well. It would take a long time for the rest of the house to get warmer would get up to 24 degrees, and my wife would still be cold. Um, and uh, so the best thing I'm going to do is put a little infrared thermal panel to raise her radiant temperature um, right next to her and make sure that she, she gets into the comfortable zone. So um, I don't think you need a thermal camera to be able to do this kind of analysis, but um, you know it's good to investigate your, your situation and see where, where you're at. And um, to get back to that question of sort of, you know, what do people find comfortable? So um, this is in uh, offices, temperature, sort of people's perception. Um, so it's lighter clothing. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting that there's this, there's this range of, um, some people think, you know, um, 22 is too cold. Other people think it's perfectly comfortable. Um, and some people even think it's too hot. So there's always this range of, of perception um, that depends on uh, a lot of different things. Um, we can talk a bit about sort of what influences someone's desire for a certain temperature or for certain comfort conditions. Um, interestingly, there doesn't seem to be any relationship with um, gender or with age or with culture. But um, that is partly because a lot of these experiments are done in, in sort of um, laboratory conditions where people have standardized clothing. Um, and what studies have found is that actually, um, for example, in offices, um, women tend to have lower clothing levels than men, and so that's why um, there is like a difference in, in perception um, there as well. So it's backed by science. Um, and back to, back to the sort of scientific part, what... Um, What's kind of interesting is that, okay, we worked out all these things in the lab, and then we do studies of actual building conditions, um, and we find, this was a study done in Singapore, and we find that, okay, there are a lot of people quite happy in these conditions. They're, um, they're not dissatisfied at all in, in these conditions, and that's kind of interesting because it's 
way more humid and way hotter than we would think is comfortable. Um, but then it turns out when you, when you sort of abandon the lab and look into, uh, into reality, into how people are living their lives, actually people are happy with quite different conditions from what the lab says. So if you look at um, sort of fully air-conditioned buildings, people, um, you know, there is some relationship between how cold it is outside. So 15 degrees, people kind of want 23. If it's, if it's 30 degrees, people might be comfortable with 25. So there's a bit of a shift. But if you look at like free-running buildings, naturally ventilated buildings where wind is coming in from outside, people are actually quite a bit happy with, quite happy with higher temperatures. And what turns out is that basically um, it's a bit like that experiment where we put a rat in a cage and like didn't give it anything to do and um, it would you know, inject itself with morphine. This is a real experiment, which is probably a topic of another nerd night. But um, you know, if you give people no freedom over their environment, they're, they're like anxious and not happy and they just want everything to be perfect. But when you give people control over their environment, like opening um, or closing windows, uh, you know, giving them the ability to shift posture, to um, change clothes, to drink cold drink or hot drink, that can make quite a big difference to people's core temperature. And so if you give people freedom and ability to make, make their own fate, let's say, people are actually quite happy with much wider temperatures, especially at the warm end. So, um, because yeah, you know, you can, so even if before they do all these things, they're already happy knowing that they can make a change, which, you know, is an interesting, interesting fact to me. Um, and then, yeah, there's kind of an, you know, this is all about thermal comfort in like stasis. Um, you know, let's like a, a sort of, okay, what's the perfect temperature? As if, like, what is the, you know, like, what is the perfect color? What is the perfect food? Like, well, nothing really. Um, the answer is like you, you want some dynamic uh, um, temperatures or you want, you want change in life. And so I think what we kind of underestimate is sort of, um, you know, we, we've built all these like perfect conditions, especially in sort of offices or, um, uh, you know, in, in, in apartment buildings. And then we kind of forget that, that there's also, you know, besides thermal comfort, there's also thermal delight. So it's not just a human thing. It's like these uh, macaques in, in Japan, they, they go into the, you know, they spend the whole day in the cold spring, in the cold, um, in the snow, and then they find this hot spring and just uh, relax. And so um, I think there's, there's quite a lot to, to think about when you think about thermal comfort. Um, there's also, you know, we could live our lives in this perfect comfort band, but that would be really boring. And, um, I'll, you know, I'm running out of time, but I will tell you something about why that is not good for us either. And so I think it's much more interesting to think a bit about life, like, okay, when, um, like a sort of thermal journey. And, we're, you know, we're familiar with thermal journeys. If you go on a, on a cold country walk, and you get, you know, soggy sh shoes and socks, and you you sort of end up in the pub, um, like by a roaring fire. That is so much joy of knowing that that roaring fire is there, knowing that you're getting warm. And so we th we should think a bit more about um, thermal thermal journeys. Um, and one thermal journey I just want to to highlight um, is the one in sleep. So, us humans, we have a natural rhythm circadian rhythm that depends on um, the time of day, or if you're jet lagged, it, it shifted. Um, and basically, we, we have like a pretty steady temperature during the day, then we get active and, and it sort of increases a bit, and then it, it drops off. Um, and it turns out that that drop is a big signal to our brain to shut down and prepare for sleep. Um, and so, that's because the body was used to outdoor environments where you know, we'd get cold at night and you'd fall asleep. And so it turns out that that, that signal is, is really important for sleep. Um, and where people have uh, been doing some experiments on 
you know, if you actively shift um, that temperature a bit, you don't have to get cold, but like if you splash water in your face, if you, if you give your skin, if you tell your body, if you trick your mind into believing that it will be cooler, you fall asleep 25% um, faster. But one stat that I want to highlight as well is for people who have um, something called sleep maintenance insomnia, which is basically when you wake up at five o'clock, lying awake, thinking, oh my God, I still would like to sleep for two more hours. I don't know who, who, you know, who has experienced that. Yeah, I'm, I'm also no stranger to this. Um, it turns out that that is really quite strongly linked to temperature. So basically, when, um, when they put people who have sleep maintenance insomnia in a controlled environment where they could uh, control the, their body's temperature using a sort of um, suit with um, cooling, they would be, the, the, the frequency dropped from 60% to 4%. So basically, 15 times fewer people would get this, this type of uh, insomnia. So really worth considering at night is like, how do you keep yourself cool and not overheat? Um, and I've been testing this now myself and, and it does really work. Um, finally, I will just um, land on the conclusion of the talk, which is basically something my wife could have said, but it actually comes from a, a scientific paper in 1916, um, which is the thermometer has been used and has acquired an authority which it does not deserve. So just like to keep that in mind um, for your, all your thermal journeys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Nick, this one is not working. So I have a blanket at work, uh, but I think I'm going to start curling up. Do we have any questions? Any questions? Come on. If not, we yeah. can play with There's, a, there's, yeah, a, question there's there. a question there. There's yeah. a question there. a question, but the your sleep insomnia thing you said, mm -hmm. I found that they used to turn the pillow over, which feels cooler. Yeah, I mean, I think that could, that could definitely help because your, your um, pillow will have accumulated heat and sweat and then if you turn it over, it'll be much cooler. So yeah, that, that would work. There was another one in the back. Yeah. So following on with that, the idea being that you're trying to keep your body cooler mm -hmm. longer throughout the night. Yep. And it, when your body temperature starts to raise up, that's what wakes you up at four o'clock in the morning. Or yeah. So, um, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question yeah. for people so, who so, want Yeah, to so basically the question is around sort of what causes you to wake up and, and whether it's important to keep yourself cooler for longer. Yeah, so um, I think it's probably related to, um, you know, temperatures rising in the morning would, would mean that the, d the day has started and you should wake up. Um, and so if you, basically if the, if the Bed, bedroom temperature gets too hot or if you get too hot under the blankets that's when you wake up and so um, you know the key is to keep yourself cooler so that's also what some people do quite naturally they put their feet from they, they sort of put their feet out from the blankets or they sort of throw off the covers um, if you see young children they, they do that quite instinctively and we always cover them up but actually they're doing that on purpose um, thermal management there are some really fancy like bed covers you can get that cool you down. I haven't tested those myself, but I'm kind of kind of intrigued. Yeah. Question over there. You mentioned a body suit. Now I'm not necessarily saying I want to buy one, but is this something that normal people can actually go and buy and sleep in, or is this was that only for the experiment? Um, yeah. So uh, the question is around a body suit and whether you can buy one and sleep in it. Um, you know, this is like, I, I have, my life is basically filled with like, oh, I should really make a business out of this. Um, and this is one on that list. Um, because I think it could also really help cool you down in other conditions. Uh, no, is the answer. But there, yeah, as I said just, just now, there are um, special sort of beds that can cool you down. And so the bed itself, like the mattress is actively cooled and that can keep you cool and improve your sleep. So that is something you can buy. I've been looking at it, but it's about 2,000 pounds, and so, yeah, I don't know. Um, I really have to convince myself that the science is... Yeah. 
I don't know. Yeah. So that's that's what you can buy at the moment. I think someone already tried to do business and is selling things called Chilo. Oh, I haven't seen that. Pillow that chills. Yeah. Chilo. I think oh, I'll, ch I'll try that. I think the key is for it to be somewhat responsive to what you're, uh, how you're feeling. Um, and so, whether like responsive to your actual temperature and your needs, you don't want it to be cold while you're trying. You know, some you don't want to be too cold either. So, um, I think this this bed cover does sort of monitor your body temperature and response. But you know, maybe um, maybe we'll find out. You had a toy you wanted. To yeah, no, I, I I do. If you could switch the um, um, bit of a bit of a gadget, um, but basically. Yeah, just uh, this is that um, thermal camera I was using earlier um, in my house to sort of sh get the evidence for uh, um, my failure as a husband to keep my wife warm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting to see. Um, we were comparing with the other speakers, like who has the coldest hands, um, and it was basically the people who arrived latest. So um, you know, it takes a while for people's um, for for people to heat up. So. Um, what you can you see here? You can see that the light is extremely hot, um, sort of yeah, ninety ninety-ish degrees. Um, I don't know, anyone that drinks, you can see them really clearly. They're they're very cold. You know, you can see heat sources like laptops. Glasses tend to re reflect heat, uh, as in like your the ones you're wearing. So they tend to reflect heat, so it's not that Evie has cold, cold eyes. Although it c could be that as well, I don't know. Uh, no, joking. But um, yeah, so it's quite a fun gadget um, to, to play around with, to sort of see um, the, the temperature in different, in different environments. I'll just briefly turn the air conditioning on. Are they, are they, um, are they pumping out cold air? Um, where is the... They're the four nope, square units. Nope, definitely not oh, on. Okay. I can feel the cold air. You can see this sort of dark slot appearing. So yeah, that, that is working. We should see it sort of start to pull down here on the on the floor soonish as well. Um, one one thing I was researching as part of this talk as well, like okay, so our thermostats operate on um, to air temperature alone, dis despite the comfort you know um, science saying that we shouldn't do that, um, and. Uh, you know, I was looking for other types of thermostats, um, and there are some, but they're not commercially available yet, unfortunately. Uh, any questions further? There's one of that. Yep. You, you, you mentioned that the <laughs> optimal yeah. comfort is not related to culture, but it, is it not related to where you've grown up, or maybe genetics? I don't know. I mean, you've got a lot of prejudices around that. And yeah. Um, so I, I did some research on this as well. It's it's quite hard to tell like conclusively. Like most of the research, like most of the thermal comfort research was done in the U.S. and Europe, um, and it was done at universities. And so, like in in a certain study, there was a in Kansas. There's no difference between American students and Middle Eastern students. But you know they've also lived in Kansas for I don't know how long. So um, there was some study showing that in India um, there was sort of a class thing. So people who were working class were had a much higher preference for or had a, had a preference for higher temperatures and so felt more comfortable at 30 degrees. Where people who were sort of professional were comfortable at 26 degrees. Um, so yeah, there is there is some evidence. Um, it's not very strong, and it, it's very situational as well. And, and I think one of the difficult things about this is that you can do lab experiments, but they don't show what people actually feel comfortable in. And there are a lot of thermal behaviors that people have learned over time that um, basically influence the results. So people might already have, being, being in, a, in a hot space a lot of the time, they have certain behaviors um, that that makes them adapt, and there's also you know if you live in a cold place, um, you adapt. Your body's metabolism can improve as well, 
and then you could produce uh, more heat uh, effectively by um, yeah, raising your metabolic rate. But yeah, there's science on that is somewhat limited, unfortunately. Any more questions, one over there? Is there anything to suggest that you get a better quality thermal comfort from wearing more clothes or having a warmer environment? So you know, can I sit my shorts in the middle of December with the heating on, or do I have to put lots of sweaters on? That, yeah, so the question is, um, is there any difference in sort of thermal uh, comfort between sort of wearing more clothes or having higher temperature? Um, it's a good question. I think not really. I don't think anything has been shown that, like they're sort of equivalent in a sense, like wearing more clothes or having a higher temperature. Um, the one thing that is a confounding factor is that um, like typically, like uh, if it's colder, the humidity might be higher. Well, if it's basically the lower the temperature is, the higher the relative humidity for the same amount of humidity in the air. Um, and so if you're, you know, if you're really stealing yourself and sort of living in a 12 degree um, home, the relative humidity might be 80, 90%, um, and that is quite unhealthy. Um, whereas if you, let's say on the other end, um, if you had the heating on at tropical levels in winter, um, it might be 25 degrees, but the relative humidity might be 40 or 30%. Um, this is not such a big problem in the UK because we're quite damp, but in the US this is a big problem because it's much colder there and drier. Um, and then at really low humidities, um, that's also not great for health because your um, the sort of mucus in your nose, nose dries out um, and that causes uh, an increased rate of infections. And yeah, there's quite a few different reasons why those extremes are not great. I'm getting very distracted by Robert's elbow being okay, very, yeah, very hot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, any more questions? Last question. No? Uh, the, the, the correlation between thermal uh, enjoyment and thermal comfort. Because the thermal enjoyment thing is, I suppose, in general, when it's cold. I mean, is there, uh, has there been any studies on that, or is that just a personal thing? Um, yeah, so, the, w sorry, could you, like, you, you personally find it enjoyable to put on an extra jumper when it's cold? Yeah. you were saying about getting cold yeah. and then sitting by a bonfire. Yeah. Not as much, no. I think um, there's this great book, which is called Thermal Delight in Architecture, but it's like a PhD study from um, 1980 or something that goes into this topic. It's it's lovely. Um, but, I don't know, people don't s study delight in the same way when it comes to, especially when it comes to something that's hard to market, let's say. Um, maybe like sauna manufacturers or, you know. Yeah, I think... Um, I don't know, I'd invite people to look into it more. Right, thank you so much. Have you tried switching rooms with your wife? I have proposed that, <laughs> um, but the proposal has been rejected because she spends a lot of time on, her, on calls, and so she prefers the bigger room. And um, the uh, pictures, like she's a big bird lover and she's put up some nice bird pictures, and so, you know. I think this is kind of an interesting point because um, I think I tend to find like very practical things hold us back sometimes, especially when it comes to uh, improving the efficiency of our home. Sometimes, like not wanting to, you know, make make a change is um, is due to these type of things. Well, that's a good one to end on. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can I have a massive round of applause for Rainy, please?